Okay. All right. Let's get started. Tim Adamo. All right. Hi, y'all. Uh, I'm Tim. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you guys about twister theory. I'll do my best to get us out of here uh, before lunch gets cold. Um, so uh, yeah, Tom uh, has actually done a lot of uh, hard work uh, this morning already, setting up some basic conventions. Uh, but uh, as ever, there will be some minor differences uh, between his conventions and my conventions, and inev inevitably between our conventions and Sabrina's conventions or Yannick's conventions. So uh, hopefully all of these differences will boil down to some small signs that you have to keep track of somewhere. But uh, anyway, so uh, what I'm going to be talking to you guys about over the next uh, four days, I guess, is uh, twister theory. Now this is a huge topic, way bigger than, than, than I would be capable of, of, of covering in such time. So instead, what I'm going to try to do is teach you, hopefully, a lot about a very small part of twister theory. And hopefully, uh, when I'm done, you'll have learned enough that you could go away and engage with some of the papers that have been written on celestial holography using uh, twister method. So uh, with that in mind, don't expect to hear anything about celestial holography from me uh, for at least a couple of days. <laughs> so OK, so uh, let's start out by just setting the scene a bit. So for for the purposes of everything I'm going to tell you guys, we're going to be living in uh, four-dimensional uh, Minkowski space. Uh, so this is going to be uh, 4D, but not just uh, Lorentzian real Minkowski space, but what we call complexified Minkowski space. So let me, what does that mean? So all that I mean by this is that I think of this uh, manifold as having uh, four holomorphic coordinates, xa, which are x0, x1, x2, x3. These are allowed to be complex. And then I equip uh, this manifold with a holomorphic metric. So the line element, uh, let's say uh, ds squared is eta ab dxa dxb, and I'll use uh, Tom's conventions here, so dx0 squared minus dx1 squared minus dx3 squared. So we think of this as a, a holomorphic metric. Holomorphic means there are no bars or complex conjugates anywhere. So this is a holomorphic metric on, on, on C4. And you can, of course, recover Lorentzian real uh, Minkowski space, so R13 sits inside this thing that I'm calling complexified Minkowski space just by imposing some reality conditions on these, these coordinates, right? So it sits in here when you say that the XAs are not valued in C4 uh, but in R4. Okay, so one of the great morals uh, of twister theory is that you should complexify everything do your calculations in this complex holomorphic setting. And then if you want Lorentzian real answers at the end of the day, it's somehow much easier to impose these sorts of reality conditions at the end of a calculation, uh, at least in the formalism of twister theory, than it is to impose them ab initio. So uh, for almost everything that I'm going to tell you guys, we'll be living uh, in this complexified four-dimensional Minkowski space. Um, but you should keep in mind that there are ways to recover Lorentzian real results um, from everything that I'm telling you. I'll, 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 I should also say that uh, you'll get emailed around my unintelligible handwritten lecture notes in which there will be equally unintelligible handwritten exercises for you to attempt. So, uh, you know, if, and some of them are to do with recovering these kind of reality conditions. So if you have questions about those, just come find me at some point over the week and I'll see if I can uh, read my own handwriting. So uh, the, the big tool we'll always be using is this kind of two-spinner formalism that Tom introduced. So uh, and this is just, uh, as we've heard many times now, exploiting this local uh, isometry between uh, the complexified Lorenz group and SL2C. Uh, but in real money, this just means any time you see a vector or one form or tensor index, you can replace it by a pair of SL2 indices of opposite chirality. And the way you do this in real money is by contracting with the Pauli matrices. So, so given, say, some vector, some four vector VA, we construct V alpha alpha dot 
Uh, also, if my handwriting starts to become too compact for people to see, just shout at me and I'll uh, blow it up again. Um, and this thing, this is just a two by two matrix which we define by taking the poly matrices, contracting them with V, and then there's some normalization uh, that we'll include. And so just to be completely explicit, Now, the question is if these are the exact same conventions that Tom picked this morning, but these are the conventions that I'll be using. And so the, the key fact uh, that, that well, one of the key facts that Tom told us is that you can observe that uh, the norm with respect to the Minkowski metric, the classified Minkowski metric of a vector oops, in, in this representation is just twice the determinant of this uh, two by two matrix. Right? So that means that if I have a null vector, um, it's null if and only if the determinant of its two spinner representation uh, vanishes. So the determinant of a two by two matrix is zero uh, if and only if either the matrix is zero or else it's simple. Um, so in particular, it has a repeated eigenvector. So that means that a null uh, four vector written in this two spinner formalism can always be decomposed into a pair of SL2 spinners. Uh, for some A and A twiddle. And of course, the converse is also true. So uh, for any pair, if you take the, the product of any pair of two spinners of opposite chirality, you get a null four vector by just running backwards through these, these equalities. So the, the real take home from all of this is that one of the great things about the two spinner formulas is it gives you an unconstrained way to talk about null kinematics or null, or, or null vectors. You just need to specify any two two spinners and you get uh, a null four momentum. You don't have to solve some quadratic equation uh, telling you that the, the four momentum is null. And so, of course, there's some conventions we need to set up for how we raise and lower these spinner indices. Tom set out some conventions this morning. I'm, I fear that mine will differ uh, ever so slightly. So uh, we raise and lower SL2 indices with uh, the unique up to scale SL2 invariant object, uh, which is the two dimensional Levi Civita symbol. So for me, this will be epsilon alpha beta 0, 1, minus 1, 0. And the same for the dotted guy. And this obeys, uh, say, epsilon alpha beta epsilon uh, gamma beta is equal to the Kronecker delta in alpha gamma, and epsilon alpha beta, epsilon alpha beta is equal to two. And so what these conventions actually imply is that the consistent way of raising and lowering spinner indices is that you, you pull down to the right, and you uh, pull up to the left. All right, so uh, if you want to amuse yourself, you can run through contracting various sides of these equalities with epsilons and convince yourself that the choice of conventions is consistent. So, okay, so uh, in, the, in the trenches, so to speak, when you're using, using this stuff, what does it all boil down to? It all boils down to making sure you get the signs right when you raise and lower things. So this is a pain. Uh, in some sense, Mathematica can do it for you. But just as an example, suppose I wanted to compute uh, this four vector, some four vector V, with one downstairs, uh, say, undotted spinner index, and the other uh, dotted spinner index upstairs. So that means we're starting, we want to start from 
this representation and raise, or sorry, lower the undotted spinner index. And so with my conventions, that's V beta alpha dot epsilon beta alpha. And because this guy is anti-symmetric, that's the same as minus uh, epsilon alpha beta V beta alpha dot. And now this is just matrix multiplication, right? So that's what it always, always boils down to. So minus 1 over square root 2, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, V0 plus V3, V1 minus I, V2. So these sorts of kind of tedious uh, calculations are lurking behind sort of everything else uh, I'll, I'll be doing. Uh, I won't spell them out explicitly, trusting that you are all capable of kind of boiling things down to, to two by two matrix multiplication at the end of the day. So uh, one of the upshots of this is that we can write our metric on our complexified Minkowski space time in terms of these two spinner variables, so, and it's just given by two of these um, two-dimensional Levi-Civita symbols. Where the coordinate, uh, coordinates are now packaged in the two-by-two two, uh, matrix. And so we, when we were back in the kind of world of, of standard sort of four vector notation, I said, well, the way you recover Lorentzian real Minkowski space is just by taking the real slice uh, in terms of these complexified xA's, x0 up to x3. How do I recover the Lorentzian real slice in this two spinner formalism? And so we want to recover R13 inside of M in this two spinner language. And to do that, you just uh, note that if you take, so what you want is some condition on this two by two matrix, which tells you that each of these numbers, x0, x3, x1, and x2, are real. And then it doesn't take long uh, to convince yourself that that's just Hermitian conjugation. So if I take the Hermitian conjugate of that matrix, I just get one over two x0 bar plus x3 bar, x1 bar plus i x2 bar. So that's the condition you get on the two by two matrix of coordinates in the two spinner formalism. But in particular, because the Hermitian conjugation involves a transpose, it's telling you that kind of Lorentzian real uh, structures interchange the two SL2 spinner representations. So they swap the dotted and undotted spinner indices. So uh, if you like uh, complex conjugation swaps the SL2C. Spinner reps. Again, what does this mean in real money? So in real money, if you if you have uh, say some undotted spinner kappa alpha whose components are two complex numbers a and b, then under complex conjugation, this gets sent to some kappa bar alpha dot, but the entries are just the complex conjugates, a bar and b bar. And so
it, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I haven't said anything about particles yet, but of course, uh, this, is, this is true. Yeah, and of course, the same thing for a dotted spinner. You'd start with a dotted spinner, complex conjugation would change it to an undotted spinner, but the entries would just be the complex conjugates. So uh, an exercise you can do is think about what reality conditions you would need to obtain other real slices, flat real slices, inside of complexified Minkowski space. So in particular, Euclidean R4 sits in here. So it is this thing that's sometimes called uh, ultra-hyperbolic signature, so R2, comma 2 as a flat manifold sits in there as well. You can uh, amuse yourself by trying to think what reality conditions you need to put on this x alpha alpha dot to obtain those real slices, and also what that does uh, to the spinner reps. OK, so uh, that's uh, enough about um, complexified Minkowski space. Let's now try and say something about twister theory. So. So I should make some sort of parental advisory here, at least for the benefit of a few faces that I see in the room, that um, twister theory is a subject which sometimes involves uh, mathematical terminology or symbols which may be kind of daunting to people coming from a physics background. Uh, it's my belief that uh, this, this is a complete uh, misunderstanding of what the subject is about. Usually everything boils down to just thinking about homogeneous polynomials of appropriate degree. So. Um, I will use mathematical words from time to time, but I will try to always explain them to you in some down-to-earth terms. In doing so, I may make angry some of the pure mathematicians I see dotted around the room. So I apologize in advance for this. OK, so let's consider the complex projective space CP3. So this is just the, the space of all complex lines through the origin in C4. Um, but a nice hands-on way of describing any complex projective space is just in terms of homogeneous coordinates. So you can describe this uh, with four complex numbers. Let me call them ZA, which is Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4, which are in C4. And these obey that they can't all be 0. So we, this, you can never have the 0 vector in here. We remove the origin. And we consider them to be equivalent. So different ZAs, are, we consider them equivalent if they differ only by an overall complex rescaling. So uh, the way we write that usually is Z. We identify it with R Z for all non-vanishing complex numbers are. And so this scaling condition is often called uh, projective, projective scaling. And the fact that all four of these z's, z1 to z4, can't be simultaneously 0, you can use this to see that there's actually only three uh, dimensions worth of freedom in this description, right? Because we can now chart. Uh, with open sets where we say, well, one of them isn't zero. So call them these open sets ui, and these are just the zas in C4 such that zi is non-zero. Um, so this is for i going from one up to four. And then because we know on this patch, uh, this open, uh, open set, that z, the ith z is non-zero, it means that we can divide out by zi. It's a non-vanishing complex number. And this relation means that that still describes the same point in our complex projective space. So we get, uh, get three what are sometimes called affine coordinates. Uh, which are just, uh, well, what shall I call them? You can call them little z. Um, well, let's just say the coordinates are z a over z i. And then the ith one would just be 1. Right, so there's always three, uh, three degrees of freedom on any kind of chart 
that you would make of this, this manifold. So in other words, although we have four complex numbers, the fact that we consider them only up to scaling and the fact that they can't all be zero means that it's just a three complex dimensional space. And this is true, I mean, this yoga works for any n. I mean, we're gonna talk about CP3, but for instance, CP1 is the Riemann sphere. And then the patches you use are just when you remove the North Pole or the South Pole, and it's just the usual stereographic projection, and Z is then the affine coordinate you get uh, on, on, on that patch. So it's something I think in some sense we're all uh, sort of familiar with in one way or another. And now we're gonna do something which is in some sense completely arbitrary. We're gonna decompose these four complex numbers that are um, defined up to this overall projective rescaling into two, two spinners. So we can call those uh, mu alpha dot, say, and lambda alpha. So in other words, uh, mu alpha dot has as its components the homogeneous coordinates z1 and z2, and lambda alpha has as its components the homogeneous coordinates z3 and z4. So at this level, this is just notation. It's a completely arbitrary decomposition. But then the, the, the key central idea of twister theory is that somehow you can relate these homogeneous coordinates on CP3 to complexified Minkowski space. And the way we do this is we use a set of algebraic relations that are often called the incidence relations. And these are just that mu alpha dot is equal to i x alpha alpha dot lambda alpha. Okay. So what is the geometric content of these relations? There's, they're just algebraic and they're linear. So first, if I forget about projective scaling and I just think of these z's as being uh, coordinates on C4, then this is an equation that says for fixed x, I get a plane in C4. So if you uh, forget about projective scaling for a second, these describe C2 inside of C4. And then if you put projective scaling back in the game, you just need to projectivize each side of this. So with projective scaling, you're getting a CP1 inside of CP3. So in other words, the, the geometric content of these incidence relations is that if you fix an x, the incidence relations define for you a Riemann sphere inside of the three-dimensional complex projective space. But it's not just any Riemann sphere. It's first of all linearly embedded because this is a linear set of equations. And it's furthermore holomorphic. And that's just because at no point did I have to tell you anything about complex conjugation either on these holomorphic homogeneous coordinates on P3 or in terms of the holomorphic coordinates on complexified Minkowski space. So the upshot here is that a point x in complexified Minkowski space, this corresponds to a holomorphic linearly embedded CP1, or Riemann sphere, inside of CP3. Now, the, the remarkable thing is that almost everything that I will tell you, well, indeed, everything that I will tell you about twister theory from this moment on, in some sense, can be derived from this one simple fact. So it's a very simple equation, but it runs the show uh, for, for sort of everything that we're going we're gonna to talk about. And there's one really important takeaway from this, which is that even though 
all of this is happening in a kind of complexified setting, three-dimensional com complex projective space, uh, really you can use your ordinary day-to-day -day 3D intuition for what's happening. And the reason for that is this holomorphicity constraint. So suppose I have two of these uh, Riemann spheres in twister space. You can start thinking about how can they intersect with each other. And if I really think of them as spheres, well, they can intersect in a point, or you could imagine they kind of intersect in a circle where they kind of smash into each other, or they could be the same, the same Riemann sphere. But in fact, this word holomorphic means that the, the second possibility doesn't happen in this setup, right? Because if the two intersect in a circle, a circle is a real one-dimensional, uh, if you like, sub-variety sub of CP1. So to define it, you would have to use uh, some anti-holomorphic coordinate which would mean that it wasn't a holomorphic uh, configuration you were talking about. So in other words, you can always think of these Riemann spheres that arise in CP3 via the incidence relations just as lines in three real dimensions. They intersect in points, or they're the same line. And furthermore, two points define a line. So this is one of the beautiful things about the holomorphy that underlies um, much of what I'll have to say, is that you can actually just think about things kind of using real geometric intuition. And so because of that, we often call these things twister lines. And we might sometimes denote them by a capital X, which you should always remember is really a Riemann sphere living inside of CP3, but one that is holomorphic and linearly embedded. Okay? So because we're able to use this kind of 3D uh, intuition, um, it, it makes it very easy to think about the kind of converse of this statement. So what the incidence relations tell you immediately, just by inspection, is that given a point in complexified Minkowski space, it tells you what you get in twister space, which is one of these twister lines. But what about the other way around? Given a point in uh, CP3, what do I get in complexified Minkowski space? So. So Z. CP3, well, because of the fact that these twister lines are always holomorphic and linearly embedded, I can think of any point in CP3 as being uniquely specified by the intersection of two twister lines. Right? So let's say Z to be um, the intersection of two twister lines. Well then, by the incidence relations, we have that mu alpha dot is equal to i x alpha alpha dot lambda alpha. That's just the incidence relation for this twister line evaluated at the point Z. But we also have the incidence relation on the twister line Y. Also evaluated at the point Z where they intersect. So then I can just take the difference. And since we're assuming that the twister lines are distinct, so that means that in particular X is not equal to Y, we find by just by taking the difference of these uh, two algebraic equations, we find that x minus y, alpha alpha dot, so if you like the separation between the two points in complexified Minkowski space, contracted with lambda alpha, has to be zero. Now, I can rewrite this in a slightly more suggestive form as epsilon alpha beta, x minus y, beta alpha dot, lambda alpha is equal to zero. So what this is saying is that if I take 
if you like, the, the two vector lambda, just thought of as a two component uh, object, and contract it with the difference vector on the undotted spinner index, I get zero. But because these are only two dimensional quantities, the only way that I can get zero is if these two quantities are proportional to each other. Right? So this, remember, this epsilon is totally skew, and it's the unique totally skew object in two dimensions up to overall scales. So what that means is that x minus y alpha alpha dot has to be proportional to lambda alpha. And that's the, the content of this equation. In fact, that's an if and only if. And if it's proportional, that just means that the constant of proportionality can be bundled into the free index in this equation, which is the dotted one. So that means we have to be able to write this in terms of some other, they're all proportional to some twiddled dotted spinner. I'll call it lambda twiddle alpha dot. Let's bring that dot down so we don't get confused. Okay. So, but we know that any time you can write a four vector as a product of two spinners of opposite chirality, it has to be null. So that means that x and y in M are null separated with respect to the, to the Minkowski metric. But it also tells us the question we were, the answer to the question we were initially asking, which is what does a point in Z correspond to? And the upshot is that Z in CP3 corresponds to a plane, a complex plane C2 inside of M whose tangent space is spanned by vectors of the form lambda alpha for lambda alpha fixed by the lambda components of Z and then arbitrary lambda twiddle alpha dot. So another way of saying it in perhaps slightly fancier terminology is that for fixed Z in CP3, we get a totally null two plane inside of complexified Minkowski space. So what we mean by totally null is just the fact that every tangent vector to the plane is null. But it also has some kind of chiral flavor to it because the span is only encompassed in varying the dotted part of the null vector. This is fixed by the point you chose in twister space. So perhaps a uh, concise way of saying it is that for fixed Z in CP3, you get uh, an, an alpha Z what we call an alpha plane. The reasons for that are, uh, well, they're not so obscure. Uh, alpha is the undotted index, and that's the thing that's fixed by the choice of point in CP3. With the tangent space uh, to this alpha plane given by the span of vectors of this form. OK. So we've learned two things, well, three things here. We've learned that for every point, once you specify these incidence relations, we've learned that for every point in complexified Minkowski space, we get a twister line, this thing we're calling a twister line in CP3. We've learned that when twister lines intersect in a point, it means the corresponding points in complexified Minkowski space are null separated. And we've also learned that more generally, a point in twister space gives this whole totally null two plane uh, in complexified Minkowski space. Now, if you put Lorentzian real reality conditions on everything, right, then at the end of the day, what will happen is that this twiddle on lambda twiddle becomes a bar, and what you get is a null geodesic in Lorentzian real um, Minkowski space, a null ray in Lorentzian real Minkowski space. So, 
Uh, yeah, so, so there's, there's some kind of nice algebraic ways of putting all of this into practice. So uh, because of holomorphicity, C2? Yeah. Is there two degrees of freedom in here? Yeah, but it's, it's in each. So I can only choose one, one door. No, this is fixed. This is fixed by the choice of Z. The thing that's up for grabs is lambda twiddle. So that's the C2. You sweep out a C2 as you vary lambda twiddle. Does it answer your question? Yeah, yeah cool. Yeah, but then uh, you would, this relationship would no longer hold. So everything we're getting here is from the incidence relation. The incidence relation tells us that the contraction between lambda and the difference is zero. Uh, yes, and then it must be null. It must be null. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. So he thinks about the real space in which two null vectors give you a time line. Yeah. But this is complex. Right? Well, but also, I mean, the, the, the definition of the space is that every tangent vector to it has this form. If I add an arbitrary vector to this, I will point off of the, the two plane. So it's, so it's not the span. It is the span. Span, sorry, over. Lambda twiddle alpha dot. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, of course, if I add any, uh, yeah, 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 any, any linear, right, okay. Is this better? Yeah, okay. Good. All right, so because of holomorphicity, and what I mean by this is just the, this fact that these twister lines, we can really visualize them as kind of lines in R3, real lines in R3. Uh, because of uh, holomorphicity, any two points, let's say Z1 and Z2 in CP3, give a twister line. And so the way you can construct this explicitly is just by considering uh, their skew span, if you like. So let's take Z1, A, Z2, B. So a priori, this is a four by four uh, matrix. Let's make it anti-symmetric. And of course, because these things are um, projective, uh, there will be an additional reduction of degree of freedom here. And now, all you need to do is evaluate all the entries of this matrix using the incidence relation. What do you get? So you'll get something like a half. I'll get my signs right here. X alpha alpha dot X beta beta dot minus X alpha beta dot X beta alpha dot lambda one alpha beta i x gamma alpha dot lambda 1 gamma lambda 2 beta minus lambda 1 beta lambda 2 gamma So this is just some not particularly enlightening uh, application of the incidence relations, just filling in this matrix. But then, um, again, you use this fact that kind of skew symmetric objects in two dimensions are unique up to scale. They all, anytime you have 
a skew symmetric tensor in, say, alpha or beta or alpha dot and beta dot, it has to be proportional to epsilon alpha beta or epsilon alpha dot beta dot. And so you can use the identity Uh, say for any uh, object, A alpha beta, if you skew over its indices, this is equal to minus epsilon alpha beta A gamma gamma. Where here I've lowered the index using uh, the levi civita symbol consistent with the conventions that we set out earlier. So if you apply this uh, identity to all of the uh, entries of that matrix, what you find is the following slightly more enlightening expression. You find that Z1A skewed with Z2B is equal to now I'll use some of Tom's uh, notation from this morning, angle bracket lambda 1, lambda 2, over 2. Whoops. And we'll call this whole thing big X A B. So where I'll adhere to Tom's convention that lambda one, lambda two angle bracket, this is lambda one alpha, lambda two alpha. Again, with the indices raised and contracted using the uh, the Levi Civita symbol. So uh, in other words, this big object, XAB, or if you like, two points in twister space, and then considering the line, the twister line that connects them, uh, this encodes a point X in complexified Minkowski space, complexified Minkowski space plus an overall projective scale which is encoded in this lambda 1, lambda 2, this, this non-vanishing, if you like, uh, complex number that comes out in front of it. So if I, if I covered this up, we would just say, oh, well, we're done. We have in two points in twister space, and this uniquely gives us uh, a point in Minkowski space. And it does, but it gives it to you up to this projective scaling. In the incidence relations, that projective scaling drops out because you have a mu on one side and a lambda on the other. But in this matrix that we've constructed, uh, it doesn't drop out. So, absolutely, absolutely. Exactly, it's supposed to be there. We would have done something wrong if it wasn't there. It's supposed to be there. Um, so at this point, you may uh, have noticed that the only thing, oh, yes, please, sorry. Mm -hmm. so but then this intersection would be the point and the radius. So, okay, nothing you've said is wrong, but what we're computing here is not the intersection of the two alpha planes. We're computing the line in twister space that connects the, t or sorry, in CP3 that connects the two, the two points. So this will be a subset of the intersection of their alpha planes, and it just so happens that, that subset is a point plus a scale. So what you say is completely correct. A point in twister space is an alpha plane in space time. I take another point in twister space, I get another alpha plane in complexified Minkowski space. Generically, these things will intersect. Fine. But now what I'm asking for is not the space time interpretation of just those two points on their own. I'm asking for the space time interpretation of the line that connects them. 
we already know what that is. It's a point in complexified Minkowski space. But now I'm saying, suppose I construct this quantity XAB, which I just take by skewing the two points. I get the information of a point in Minkowski space, but I also get some projective scale because this is a projective object that I've constructed. These Zs are homogeneous coordinates. In the incidence relations themselves, you don't see this because there's a mu on one side and a lambda on the other. So the mu and the lambda have the same projective scale and everything drops out. But here I've just taken two Zs, skewed them together, and I get this uh, four by four uh, skew symmetric matrix X. And with the incidence relations, the, what this is is some overall scale encoded in the lambdas and then an X. That's all I'm saying. So what you said wasn't, wasn't wrong, it's just that's not what we're actually computing. Is it, is it okay? Yeah, cool. Other questions? Going once, not twice, sold. Okay, so um, you may have noticed that somehow the only thing we've really said about that's invoked the Minkowski metric has always been some statement about vectors being null or not null. Right? Everything about this correspondence between CP3 and complexified Minkowski space that we've got via the incidence relations, it only tells us when points are null separated, nothing else. And that's equivalent to only telling us something about the kind of uh, conformally invariant structure on Minkowski spacetime. So, um, so, so far, nothing we've said uh, fixes the conformal structure uh, on complexified Minkowski space uh, from CP3 equipped with these incidence relations. Because the only thing we're learning about is when points are null separated, and that's a conformally invariant uh, notion. You do a conformal transformation on spacetime, it doesn't change uh, the, the light cones, if you like. So uh, one way of, of seeing all of this on CP3 is the following. So uh, the conformal the conformal group on M, because everything is complexified, this is just SO six C. So you take a appropriate real uh, real slice of this, you get the conformal group that uh, Piotr was writing down for us before. And this is just locally isomorphic to SL4C. So uh, we can build conformally invariant uh, quantities on M using the uh, uh, using SL4 invariant objects. Um, so, for instance, the uh, natural SL4 invariant is, of course, the Levi Chivita, the four dimensional Levi Chivita symbol. Epsilon A, B, C, D. So, just on this completely algebraic level, it's clear that on CP3, any quantity. Uh, of the form epsilon a, b, c, d, z1, a, z2, b, z3, c, z4, d will correspond to some sort of conformal invariant down on com complexified Minkowski space when I apply the incidence relations. How however, it's going to be conformal on m. However, if I think of this, remember this Levi-Civita symbol is totally skew symmetric on its indices. 
So in particular, it means that it's skew symmetric in Z1, Z2, and in Z3, Z4. But the skew of Z1, Z2 is this quantity big X AB that we just computed up here. So if you denote X AB is equal to kind of Z1, A, Z2, B, and say Y AB is equal to Z3, A skewed with Z4, B, then this quantity, epsilon A, B, C, D, Z1, A, Z2, B, Z3, C, Z4, D, this is just uh, proportional to, there's probably some number in a sign which I'll get uh, wrong, so let's uh, not worry about that. Epsilon A, B, C, D, X, A, B, Y, C, D. And then you can use the explicit form of that, those matrices that we've given up there and the, the levy chivita symbol to compute what this actually is. And again, proportionally, so up to some power of factors of a half and a sign, this will just be lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4, x minus y squared down on space time. So the point is that we can define, uh, if you like, uh, something that we might think might be a metric on complexified Minkowski space using these XAB variables that you get from CP3. But it's not really a well-defined metric. So in other words, we can build something. Let's call it ds squared epsilon a, b, c, d, dx, a, b, dx, c, d. And you might hope that this is somehow going to give you the metric uh, on Minkowski space. But it can't because the whole thing has to be conformal because you've just built it out of these epsilon a, B, C, Ds. And the way that you see that is, again, if you just plug and chug with that formula for X, A, B, take an exterior derivative, crank it in there, what you'll, you'll get, again, up to constants of proportionality, is X alpha alpha dot dx alpha alpha dot uh, times these scale factors. So in other words, uh, this object can't be a well-defined metric. It can't induce a well-defined metric on Minkowski space because it's not scale invariant. If I do a projective scaling of Z1 and Z2, then that X AB also scales, which means that this metric scales. So it's not well-defined metric on Minkowski space. So what we need to do, need to build Instead, a metric of the form ds squared is epsilon a, b, c, d, dx, a, b, dx, c, d, with some conformal factor, let me call it p2 of x, which is a homogeneous function. So in particular, with p2, if I scale its argument by some non-vanishing complex number, I need to get that non-vanishing complex number squared times the guy with the original argument. OK, so a metric of this form will be scale invariant when I scale, do a projective scaling of the variables on twister space. And it will at least have, it will be conformal to the Minkowski metric because of this relation. So we're getting the Minkowski norm here, but we're getting it up to the scale. So the idea is we want to get rid of the scale, and we want to get rid of it in a way that leaves us with exactly the Minkowski metric. And the point is that to do this, uh, so, so in other words, let me, let me be a bit more precise. This, uh, this gives a metric on x, a, b, um, which you can think of as homogeneous coordinates on c, p, 5, okay, because it's skew such that uh, epsilon a, b, c, d, x, a, b, x, c, d, 
is equal to zero minus the zero locus of this kind of conformal factor that we've multiplied by. And the idea is we want to choose this conformal factor so that the zero locus is the infinity of Minkowski space that we, that we expect. So one, I mean, the way to really do this is just to do it by inspection. So let's define a quantity I a B, which is just one half zero 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 epsilon alpha beta. This thing is sometimes called the infinity twister for reasons that will become apparent. Then and we're going to let P2 of x just be I A B x A B squared. Okay? So this obviously has the correct scaling property. So if I whack it underneath this conformal metric, I'll get something that's scale invariant. But do I get the right thing? And what you can show is that, if, again, if you plug. Yeah, please. This is exactly what it corresponds okay, to. Yeah, I mean, so, so yeah, I mean, we have here Yannick, who I'm sure will uh, yeah, tell you guys the right way to think about this, but that's exactly what's happening. I mean, you should think of this IAB as being, if you conformally compactified Minkowski space, then spatial infinity is a point, which means in CP3 it should be a line, and this is the line. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, right, so if you evaluate what this actually is using the expression for the big XAB, what you get is just lambda 1, lambda 2 squared over 4, which is exactly what we're after. There's no X dependence here. All it's going to do is get rid of this this scale here. So it, a nice exercise um, is to convince yourself that uh, now ds squared being kind of dx ab, dx ab, where I lower pairs of skew four-dimensional indices using the four-dimensional levi chivita symbol with this choice of um, with this choice of conformal factor, this really is the Minkowski metric that we wrote down at the beginning. But the point is, the takeaway from all of this is just on twister space, to really get the Minkowski metric and not just the conformal class of the Minkowski metric, you have to introduce some new quantity which breaks conformal invariance, something other than an epsilon ABCD. And that quantity is this thing that we call the infinity twister, IAB. You can make different choices for this and get other conformally flat space times, like complexified ADS or DS. It's complex, so it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, so in this case, we're just talking about um, Minkowski space. Um, so one, I'll, I'll finish with just this quick observation that uh, what are the, what is the zero locus? This is going to provide another answer to, to your question. The zero locus of this guy is the same as saying that lambda 1, lambda 2, is equal to zero. Angle bracket lambda 1, lambda 2 is equal to zero. So how can that be possible? Well, there are two ways it can be possible. Usually we would like to say, well, it's possible if lambda 1 is proportional to lambda 2. Right? But our starting assumption was that lambda 1 and lambda 2 were components of two points in CP3. We assumed that they were distinct points. If lambda 1 is proportional to lambda 2, the incidence relations would imply that the mu's were also proportional, so they'd be the same point in twister space. So by assumption, they can't be proportional to each other. So then the only way that this angle bracket, this skew contraction of them can vanish, is if they're actually zero. So this implies that if you like lambda 
1 alpha is equal to 0, say. So in other words, in other words, points in CP3, uh, which correspond to uh, this zero locus of P2 on complexified Minkowski space, they all have the form ZA is equal to mu alpha dot zero. But as we just alluded to, these are sort of points at infinity in complexified Minkowski space. We don't want to include them. So the last thing we'll write down today is the definition of twister space that we're going to use for the rest of the week. Twister space, I'll call it PT. This is just the set of all Zs in CP3, such that the lambda components of the Z are not 0. Okay, so in other words, we're taking all the machinery that we talked about for most of the lecture for all of CP3, and we're removing the line that corresponds to points at infinity in Minkowski space. And this is what we're going to mean um, for the rest of the week when I talk about twister space. It's an open subset of three dimensional complex projective space defined by this condition that the lambda alpha components of the homogeneous coordinates uh, cannot be simultaneously vanishing. Okay, with that, let's go uh, get, get, get some lunch. If you have questions, come find me, uh, yeah, so before the food gets cold. <laughs> I can't remember the magic button. I don't, don't want to